for those of you who have seen me perform before, uh, we're very used to the kind of dynamic where you're watching, you're watching and I'm doing the thing. But today is going to be a little bit different. Today is going to be a little bit more of a chorus adventure. There will be a little interacting. It's okay. Um, when I first first started Femme Fatale, we were in the Melody Bar at the Gladstone, and then we moved to Unit 2, which is like a loft slash a house slash art space by that's cultivated or curated by Nick Murray and Rosina Kazi from LOL. And my best friend Hillary gave me this, so we would... Because it's kind of like, it's like not really like a show place, but they kind of made it into a show place. So um, I, we hung this against the, like, like on the wall. So this was like the backdrop um, for, for, my, for the burlesque performer. My father went to work in Nigeria for a couple of years. And he brought this really simple house dress back to me from the motherland and he came back different and changed and I don't even think he knows yet 
all the ways that it changed him to be there. But when I wear it, when I choose to wear it, it only ever feels right to wear it with the moon. So this ring is a silver crow skull ring that I got while in New Orleans this past summer. And basically it is me. Uh, it is, it, it's a very good descriptive essence of myself where it's like, it's a fierce yet majestic yet super intelligent creature. Um, and even in death, it's still beautiful and it's still impactful on many, many people. <laughs> Growing up with a mother who was a dancer, who was then forced to stop dancing because of being diagnosed several different times with cancer, it was hard to see her fighting a failing body. But it was funny because she found joy in the small things, in you know a dress that made her still feel like she could spin around and dance, or in her favorite bathrobe that on bad days she was confined to the house in, but on good days you'd find her twirling through the living room as if it was a fancy ball gown. When my mother passed uh, in 2010, I didn't have the courage to go through her items before my father did, and a lot was lost to Goodwill because his process was purging and my process was saving. But the funny thing is, eight years after he purged nearly everything of hers that I hadn't taken uh, or been, you know, had given to me when she passed, I found myself really missing my mother one day and sorting through an old gym bag of mine, I found the plaid robe tie to her favorite bathrobe, the one that despite many Christmases past where we gave her new bathrobes and urged her to give up that original bathrobe that, you know, signified her first battle with cancer, but also signified her freedom when she would find that, you know, energy to dance in this bathrobe. Uh, I found the tie for it in and amongst my socks. I don't even know where it came from. I don't know how it got into there. I, I couldn't tell you why it was saved and nothing else. Um, so I kept it and I, and I hung it on the back of my bedroom door and there it stays to this day when I need a little bit of my, my mother's energy. I hold on to it before I go out the door and I say a couple words to her and then off I go, you know, spinning into the street and taking her, her energy with me. So when Coco approached me and said, I'd like something that means something to you, to have braided into my hair by my mother. You know, I, I searched through my house for all sorts of beautiful fabrics with meaning, cloth I've gotten from dear friends in Africa. But honestly, the first thing that came to my head was my mother's bathrobe tie because she was such a strong force and such a strong link. And what was such a simple object brought me so much comfort after her passing, years after her passing, when it turned back up and brought her so much comfort through some of her darkest days. So it's a blessing to be able to see it worked into this piece. So, this is a dashiki. It's a fabric that has been around for like ages, years and years and years. Our great, great, great grandmothers used this. And good thing about this is this particular design of print has been around is the same thing they just keep doing replicas replicas but it's the same that she is called different names in different parts of countries in africa but the same pattern is used in west africa in east africa and some part of the northern africa so it's pretty much universal to almost all the african countries unlike the other african prints that every little country or east and west have their own different designs and their own different cultures this is pretty much known to almost all the countries in africa and it's been around for so long and it's still very much popular and trendy that we can still make 
very exquisite dresses special location dresses using this and you can still make casual dresses and both men and women use it who has the good thing about it too so it's a little piece for you thank you all the best my dear and I am a uh, female entrepreneur, fashion designer based in Toronto of a clothing label called Kayla K and I focus primarily on working with Ankara or Intima African printed cotton fabrics um, to design luxurious, beautiful, out of the box um, evening wear, classic wear uh, clothing for the modern woman um, who wants to obviously stand up in a crowd because my clothes are so printed um, and so bold um, that it definitely is a conversation starter. Um, and my familial history um, is from Ghana. So we're from Ghana, West Africa. And I had the privilege of living there for the first five years or so of my life. Um, but we We've, you know, been in Canada now for a better part of over 30 years. Um, and, you know, as a kid growing up in another country, I became Canadian so quick, um, you know, so fast, just with the kids and the school system. And so did lose a bit of that connection emotionally and mentally with um, Ghana and with the motherland. Um, but I have found... I guess I, could, I could have found myself over the last few years and I'm so grateful that I've been able to get back in touch with my roots and the older I get the more important it has become to me, um, for myself and for my children, uh, which is why a big mainstay of my clothing brand is using these Ankara right, or as we also call it, Entima um, cotton printed fabrics from Africa because I really wanted to show the beauty in the rich textiles and in the history of Africa and also to show that these prints as bold and as vibrant as they are could be worn all year round and maybe aren't necessarily just for big events or big festivities but they can become mainstay in a woman's closet, they can become mainstay in women's lives and, and my pitch is that my brand should become a fabric of people's lives. Um, it's an opportunity to for people to connect with Ghana and to connect with Africa and to connect with the motherland and I'm also hoping that as I continue to grow um, the brand, obviously that my children, um, them not having had the opportunity to live um, in Ghana, that they will be able to use the brand as a way for them to connect with their roots and connect with their history. Um, I have four fabulous children and I'm married to a very African man. Um, so to the both of us, it's very important that our children have some concept of the history and have respect for 
um, the history of our family and, of course, um, Ghana and um, Africa. So, so that's a bit of my story, um, who I am, what I do, and why I work with these fabulously vibrant prints um, that I do. So, yeah. My name is Safira, and I go by the stage name Obscura. Self-expression and creativity is a very large part of my life, so it was only fitting that I tried to find the best outfit for my maternity photo shoot. I wanted the photo shoot to be colorful and vibrant, so we chose to do it in Graffiti Alley. I also have a thing for alleys and love walking down alleys and exploring them, so I, I was trying to find a colorful sort of abstract outfit. I wanted the outfit that would show off my baby belly, be flowy and feminine all at the same time. Well, I found a poncho that was multicolored, sort of like a floral garden pattern of abstract flowers that were peach, white, and black on a really lovely medium blue background. I was drawn to it immediately. Being 36 weeks pregnant, I thought it was the time to indulge finally in a beautiful maternity piece. Throughout my pregnancy, I really managed to avoid maternity clothing, to be honest with you. I thought most of it was way too costly and unflattering. I really clung to my old pre-baby identity through my clothing. Little did I know that that very act of wearing this colorful maternity poncho was my expressive core, making and creating a space for my new identity, which is motherhood, while learning to accept and navigate uncharted territory. I had no idea what I was getting myself into before becoming a mother. Giving my maternity poncho to you, Coco, allows me to shed that old part of me that once was and never will be. It gives space to find a new way of self-expression in my new identity and journey into motherhood. I'm really trying to expand into expansiveness on the daily and learn to be free in this really new and challenging role. Through my own way, with my heart, finding little ways that were different than before to express and to explore. Motherhood has been so beautiful, including every little bit of difficulty, and there were many. I will continue to evolve, because evolution is key. I just have to find new ways of self-expression in my new role. And uh, it's been a challenge, but, um, but every day I'm learning. And I think every day I'm getting there slowly. Thank you, Coco. Thank you for having me a part of this piece. Okay, tell me about the receiving blanket. This receiving blanket, you know, I had from Jamaica. And when my first baby was born, and then this child was born here in the cold of February. And I remember going off to the hospital in the, in the snow banks and the slush, and coming back a few days later in the February thaw. And that's why I remember there's a February thaw now. Anyway, I thought, this little blanket, what's this going to do in this cold weather? But of course, it was just fine in the house. This is the hem of a skirt um, that I wore on the plane when I came to Canada from Jamaica when I was a child. Um, when I look at it, it just reminds me how tiny I was and um, how excited I was to finally be reunited with my, my parents and my siblings all in the same place. We'd been separated for a couple of years and finally we were together and 
I was in my new home and um, Canada was my new home and um, Canada is my home. mother on my mother's side uh, is from Jamaica and uh, she was married for over 50 years to my grandfather and uh, emigrated to North America to um, New York and they 
raised 10 children, believe it or not, together, and definitely one of my sheroes. But specifically, um, I used to go to New York and visit with my family, and um, I always saw my grandmother wearing dresses and suits. I mean, she was very, very, very much a God-fearing uh, Christian lady, so she always had the hats and, and the feathers and all that kind of stuff. And I remember the first time I saw her wearing that nightgown, she was actually um, just getting ready for bed, and I was downstairs, and I looked up, and I saw her at the top of the stairs in this nightgown, and she looked so angelic and so beautiful. It was almost like it was the first time I, I sort of noticed her as a woman, and I just thought, wow, she was so beautiful. So when she passed away, I actually inherited that nightgown, and so you have it there. So I'm very happy that you can include that in your piece. Um, the brooches are, are also items that she wore regularly to church and to um, special functions. And the handkerchief actually is extra, extra special because um, she carried that with her all the time. She had like a rotating um, group of handkerchiefs and that was her favorite. And so I also inherited that too. And I carried it with me on my wedding day in 2009. So extra, extra special. I, I wrote a multidisciplinary play called Daughters of Lilith, um, which I wrote because um, the first, I'm a late bloomer in life. <laughs> so my, my first relationship and then my, first, my very first heartbreak happened. And after, after he and I broke up, I wrote this play about um, grief and rage um, and about six black women who were witches, but, um, and they were sisters, um, but they forgot that they had magic in them. And so all of them re reunite in this forest um, because each one of these sisters had, had gone through a particular kind of grief or heartbreak. And so it was sort of like um, through a combination of shock and grief and, and heartbreak, they were propelled back home um, and I call, and they, they were calling for their mother, which is Lilith, which I grew up in the church. So Lilith is to me the first witch and Eve is the first mother. So, um, so I wrote this, I wrote the play and I was really lucky because I got really incredible, you know, um, performers to be a part of my vision because I couldn't look at my, my first heartbreak head on. I had to split myself into six people to to write that play and be those six different women. So I was lucky that I got six, um, five other really great actors and performers and storytellers and artists who are incredible in their own right to come and help me tell that story. And they became my sister witches. Um, so I got Miranda Warner, I got Ivory, um, Rania, Al Mugamar, um, Sheree, Leon. Um, and Amber Williams King and this is the red rope which is is on, which is, is on the stage and never leaves it's the only thing that's I guess really constant um, on the stage in, in Daughters of Lilith and um, if you ask Ivory about this she will laugh because this was left over from Ivory's wedding so it was so interesting because I, I like um, I visioned this red rope that's like a, partly an, an umbilical cord that connects all black women together. And I was like, I need a rope that's heavy but light that we can all carry. And Ivory was like, girl, I got you. What can you tell me about the umbilicus? <laughs> so the umbilicus is actually um, woven together by the team who did Daughters of Lilith, which is an incredible play based on basically moving through the world as a black woman and uh, what that archetype looks like, uh, how many different forms we all take. Uh, it was written by Toronto playwright Dainty Smith, a dear friend of both of ours. And uh, 
when she wrote it, she saw us unfurling this long cord that bound us all together across the stage, and she needed red fabric. And I said, well, I have 3,000 meters of it in my basement, and I'd love to give you some. And the joke is that when I got hand-fasted five years ago, I saw my bridesmaids wearing hibiscus. So not quite red, not quite orange, somewhere in between. And I ended up contacting the Canada Tool Company to make me my perfect hibiscus tool to make these dresses. And long story short, they originally liked the color so much they were going to pay for the dye lot and I could just take the 55 meters I needed. Then when the dye lot happened, they determined that it was too close to the red that they had, but not quite orange enough for them to want to sell. So either I had to buy 3,000 meters or I got none. <laughs> so I bought the 3,000 meters, filled my car to the rafters, just myself, my partner, and our girlfriend in the back, who literally couldn't see over top of the fabric. It was that filled with all of this fabric. We had to drive all the way up to Peterborough to get it, just for the 55 meters. <laughs> and I've been parceling it off over the last five years. Um, you know, in the funniest ways, whenever somebody ends up needing something for something, you know, fantastic or over the top or that really matters to them and they need just the right kind of fabric, I end up dragging out the hibiscus tool. And so when we made the umbilicus, Dainty didn't want to take too much. She just wanted one bolt and we'd find a way to make it look thicker on stage. And I end up showing up with three whole bolts of fabric and enlisting the rest of the cast to start braiding. And we braid and we braid and we braid and it just keeps going. And it's reaching out the end of the Daniel spectrum into the hallway and everybody's watching us braid full bolts of fabric. We're tossing bolts between, between all of us. And uh, Dainty's eyes are just sort of filling up and she's like, I didn't know this is what it needed to be, but it needed to be this because we all sort of wove our magic into it and uh, now it gets to get braided again and it just seems so fitting to go with you. <laughs> Thank you. And what else has this fabric been used for? But, well, here's the joke is that uh, when uh, I got a call from you a little while back, I think it was two uh, Toronto Burlesque Festivals ago, that you were looking for fabric that could glide across the audience, I ended up instantly suggesting the hibiscus tool and dropping two bolts to Brooke, um, our mutual friend and uh, costumer. And Brooke didn't end up using them, they kind of sat in, in a corner. And so two years later, I'm about to get on stage with Fe Les Femmes Fatales, our troupe, and uh, one of my dear girlfriends in the burlesque troupe takes the stage to debut a piece that was about loss and gain and being fierce and coming back from her miscarriage. And she takes the stage in this huge skirt made out of red tulle. <laughs> But it's not quite red, it's hibiscus. And I can see it from the crowd and I'm weeping because it's such a powerful piece. And I know, wait a minute, I know that tool. And so I catch her backstage and I wrap her in my arms and we're both weeping and I'm losing my mind about her performance. And I say, I have to ask you, who made your skirt? And she says, Brooke, isn't it amazing? I said, it's double amazing because it's my wedding tool. And I'm so glad that you were able to give it that life and we just lost it together. So it's sort of like the sisterhood of the traveling tool. <laughs> and every time somebody needs some, you know, I, I end up hearing and, and being able to gift as need be. The joke was originally when we purchased it all, my girlfriend, who's also a sewer, said, oh, you'll have no problem getting rid of this on Queen West. Well, five years later, nobody bought any tool, but everybody who needs it is there at the right time for me to gift it to them. So here you go. That is amazing. Thank you. <laughs> my name is Shashi Dawkins, and this is the story of my purple fabric. I'm a black and indigenous American woman. My parents were black nationalists. I have been a hairstylist for 25 years and this fabric was presented to me as a gift from a client who was born in Uganda. She went back home and brought this back for me. I was so honored to receive it. Soon after getting her gift, I experienced my own spiritual awakening. At that point, I stopped whatever I was doing and made myself sacred space. I used this fabric as my altar cloth for years. And with this fabric, I learned to love all aspects of me and begin to heal my inner child who didn't know not only was she enough, but her feelings are valid and she is wise beyond her years. This represents the divine, sovereign, feminine goddess energy that is passed on through women in our lineage. I have the best memories of sitting on the floor while my mother braided my hair in cornrows while she told stories of the women I come from. 
My name is Cheeky Diamond, and this is the story of my alligator fabric. So I am a multiracial, female-identifying individual, and my mother is Caucasian, and my father is African-American and Belizean. So this fabric came from a romper that was made for me by my grandmother on my mother's side. So my grandmother is a Caucasian woman from a very small town, and her and I were inseparable until I was about 16 years old, and one day she took me to the store when I was about five and let me pick out fabric for a romper that she was going to make me. So I picked out this alligator fabric, and she took it home and made me an outfit, and I have cherished and loved it since, since then. So my grandmother is a Caucasian woman from a small town who is a Trump supporter. So from early on, it was it was clear that I was loved and cared about. But as I grew up and started identifying more as a person of color and identifying more with kid, like having the concerns of people of color and having that be a part of my identity, it became an issue in my relationship with my grandmother and that has been a part of our our lives and one of the reasons i'm so proud that this piece has made it into this project is because hair specifically is a is a triggering topic between myself and my grandmother who has a very strong opinion of how black women should wear their hair and how black women should be presented in society which has been an underlying way that has shaped my beliefs that I've had to deal with as again as being a multiracial woman who has a very complicated relationship with a an older white woman who I will forever love and cherish but doesn't see me in the entirety of my identity who only sees the grandchild that once was and is now something different.
And then as it warms up, maybe start to feel a little itch. And then that itch becomes a tingle. The tingle becomes a burn. And the burn makes me crazy. And this man put the last one on my scalp. And it instantly started burning. So I told him, it's burning. And he said, no, it couldn't be. It couldn't possibly be burning. I just put it on your head. And I said, no, it's, okay. it's burning. And he said, you're being kind of dramatic, aren't you? It can't be burning. I just put it on your head. And I sat there. My head is burning. And then once he rinsed it out, He sat me back in the chair in the middle of this fancy salon where all kinds of known faces were having their hair done as well. Nobody seemed to notice this little tiny girl. It's very small, 13. And he spun the chair around, spun it away from the mirror. And he said, You got a lot.
all of 